Uh, CPIM has just released its election manifesto today mm -hmm. and it also has a legacy of and a continuing legacy, an enduring legacy of participating and being and leading governments in many of the states in India. So based on this, what do you see as the alternative the CPIM and the broader left actually places in front of the people? Well, you know, that is a very uh, a difficult thing. See, as the CPIM, as a communist, we believe in revolution. We believe in socialism. And this is a crudely, grossly capitalist society which has not even been able to get rid of all the old feudal baggage and has coexisted, strengthened. And so you're coming at it with a, you know, with a, with a, a state which is very strong and very, very powerful with all the latest technology and everything. So, and the constitution also, the federal structure, the states have limited rights. But we know that we cannot avoid the parliamentary path. It is very important for us as communists to participate in these elections and to use the electoral platform, even though we know it is so loaded against us because of huge corporate money coming in, which was there, but it was never to that extent as it is today. Imagine now in the Supreme Court, even the Supreme Court has taken note of the CPM's petition. Now they're getting foreign funds also. So Indian political parties are getting foreign funds and it's legal. So anyway, so within that framework, what can we do? And what have we done? So the first thing I want to say is, we understand that there are limitations. You know, winning government in a provincial state, in, pro in a province, you know, in a state. We call it a state, a state assembly, a provincial assembly. And winning uh, power at the center, they're two entirely different things. Now, in the provincial assembly where we have formed governments, three or four things which we have taken very seriously. One is trying to break um, land monopolies. I think that was critical in that period of the 60s and 70s when we were in government in West Bengal. And it was the Kisan movement, the peasant movement, which was in the forefront of bringing the red flag into the center of Bengal and national politics. And the government responded in the way a communist government must do. And I think, I mean, for me, I was a student then. It was one of the things which inspired me in the 60s to come into the party and to join the movement. It was this commitment to break that land monopoly and to go ahead with radical land reform, facing repression, facing police firing, but the party strongly supporting it. So our government was born in the crux of that struggle for land and food. So we continued with that policy and then we expanded it with trying to change the nature of political representation and to bring the voices of the exploited into the political arena directly through elections. I mean, I think that was an, an inspirational step because I think it made a huge, because you can have land reforms, but if your political representatives are all representatives, the ruling classes, you're bound to be pushed back. So this land reform combined with Political representation was very, very critical. We call it the panchayat system, which is local governance. So that had a tremendous impact. Thirdly, in other states, for example, in a state like Kerala, we have, because uh, it's a different, you know, each state in India has its own history, its own tradition, and its own geographical location, the different type of industries and livelihoods for people. And in Kerala, now with our government in Kerala, taking forward the experience there. We have, um, I think it's wonderful, we have for education and health, that is our priority. And we have set up missions. And you won't believe it, I think in the whole world, where you have government schools shutting down and people shifting, forced to shift their children to private schools. The only state in the whole of India, and I'm sure in the whole of Asia, perhaps apart from China, would be Kerala, where people are taking their children out of private schools and bringing them into public schools and government schools because the government is upgrading the schools, budgetary allocations, and trying to ensure that you have equality at the school system level. How can you even talk about merit 
without ensuring a system which will bring out the potential in every ch single child. And then you see now everybody talks about this basic income business, basal social income, you know, the Congress party is now. They are doing this, but what about basic universal services? You see, they took it from Brazil and the Brazil experience said, you know, if you give a certain income guarantee, you do it. But you have to look at the other social parameters. You have to see you're getting free health, getting free education, getting subsidized food. If you can't get jobs, yes, this income, a basic income helps. But here, you want to remove basic universal services. You want to privatize all those services and say, hey, look, I'm giving you this much money as a basic income. Now, not, that is not something that, of course, anything which helps the poor, that's good. But you can't help the poor with one hand and then just slam them and smash them because every other need of theirs is going to be handed over to the private sector. You can't do that. But, you know, that's what's happening. So this is... so. The alternatives that we are looking at and where we can provide them within limited resources is within this, like public education, public health, with all the resources we have. And I tell you, it's made a huge difference. I mean, Tripura, a small state in the Northeast, tribal population of 30%, uh, 32%. The only state in India which has defended the rights of the Adivasis, the indigenous people, ensured that not an inch of their land was taken away and in fact was given land rights is it's Tripura and you know that was where you had the separatist militancy you could have used draconian laws it is a one state in India in which we withdrew the armed forces special powers act which is one of the most draconian laws and we the first state in India we, we said no we don't want it because we're in political dialogue so, you know, these are different things and I think it's also important about ideology because, you know, when Marx says that ideology becomes a material force, of course it was in a different context, a different situation, but I can tell you ideology, it is so important because your commitment is reflected in a much wider conceptualization of what India should be. And you must have an ideology of commitment to people's rights because, you know, parliamentary politics is very, very tough. And um, unless it is properly combined with struggles of the people and movements of the people and reflecting the voices of the people, you can't really build an alternative. And in a very modest way, I think the CPIM in these years of our existence since 1964, we have tried, uh, I think, mainly successfully to combine these two aspects. And you mentioned the difficulties of parliamentary politics and the BJP is now, uh, the, its electoral machine is huge, the amount of br money it's bringing in is unprecedented. So based on your own travels in the country, especially over the past couple of months, what is the feel you've got of the resistance that's building up from the Ah, it's wonderful. I mean, if you can work at 45 degrees and just, not me, I'm talking about a uh, card, I'm talking about uh, without anything, with just a glass of, you know, maybe a bottle of water slung on their shoulder and a cloth bag, you have that commitment, you have that energy, you have that vision, and we don't have money, and that's, uh, of course, it's a huge disadvantage and handicap. Very often, we can't even feed our card. Left home early in the morning and coming and working, going around with a candidate or doing whatever booth wise work they have to do. So, even the minimum sometimes we're not able to give them. But every day, and I, I say this with, with such humility and with such respect that you learn something every day because every day you come across somebody who's got some really big problem, but there she is. You know, she's got the red flag in her hand. She's got the voters list in her hand. She's going door to door. And you ask her, and, you know, so it doesn't matter, comrade, you know, we have to win this battle. And you are against a, a huge machine. You are against the state. And there is a sort of a consensus among the ruling classes and their representatives said, we do not want a presence of the left in parliament. 
they're far too much of a barrier for us. And it has been proved that when the left has been strong in parliament, people's rights have a better chance of being defended and divisive issues have a better chance of being buried and people's issues have a better chance of being foregrounded, which has not been there in the last five years because we did have a smaller presence. But in spite of that, I think our comrades in parliament did a wonderful job. Um, they were really the, the, uh, the voice of the people. And especially if you look at the way minorities and Dalits, the scheduled castes and the Muslim minority in particular, and the Christian minority also. I mean, there have been more than 3,000 incidents recorded um, of violence. We have had lynchings of innocent uh, Muslims in the name of cow slaughter, you know, because they, they were accused of slaughtering a cow, manufactured most of the time. But the killing of a cow is considered more of a criminal act than the killing of a human being. And there are people in this country who want the death sentence for that. So this is the kind of thing we are facing in our elections. And recently, this fake nationalism and nationalistic rhetoric, which is really the, a desperate government and a desperate prime minister who is not accountable for the many unfulfilled promises, is now resorting to that sort of a thing. My country, you know, America first says Trump, and you have a similar echo over here, of course, in different language, but the same kind of chest thumping. And we know who's America is first, and we know who's India is first. It's India's corporate. So we know that. We know the similarities all over the world uh, in which right wing forces uh, seek to take over the entire political uh, scenario, either this right wing or that right wing, and they want to divide it all between them. Tweedledee and Tweedledum, but of course, a very toxic Tweedledee and Tweedledum. And we have the same in India in a much worse way because this is a party which is not like an ordinary party in that sense. So elections is very tough and money is a very big issue, of course. And also the misuse of state power against us. Now, for example, in a state like Bengal, we have false cases against around 100,000 of our activists. We have around 20 to 25,000 activists who cannot go back to their own areas. They will be killed, and yet they are working there. Uh, we have a situation in Tripura where our candidate's car was um, stopped, and he was attacked three times in one day by the BJP hooligans. In Bengal, it is the state government, the, a party called the Trinamool Congress, which has pretensions of fighting the BJP, but follows exactly the same policies in the state of Bengal anti-communist and strongly anti-democratic, more than anti-communist, I would say wider anti-democratic, no dissent. And so we're fa facing violence also in many parts. In Kerala, the RSS has been mobilizing on the issue of religion and trying to, after the Supreme Court judgment, which lifted the prohibition of women's entry into a temple, they mobilized on the basis of tradition and said, you know, this is against our traditions. This is, communists are attacking our religion. You know, the usual stuff of the right wing. So it is tough, but I think that the resistance which is there, and I think in spite of this, the fact that the red flag is there, we are fighting, so far we have announced candidates for 71 seats. And we're putting up a jolly good fight. And I'm very confident that we will have a much better presence in Parliament. Thank you so much, Comrade. That's all we have time for today. Keep watching People's Dispatch. Hey, ta -ta.